love that song because it's, it's so true, right? Gravity just seeks to bring us down. And then he mixes the metaphor with light. And uh, this weekend's all about Jesus as the light of the world, where he says, I am the light. But gravity, it's at work in all of us, right? Always working against us, always kind of trying to tear us down if we're married, in our marriages, if we're dating, in our dating life, in our career paths, whatever. It's, it's this force that's always working against us, if you will. I have a kind of a graphic case of gravity. Uh, so most of you would be familiar with this story. It, it happened now, I think, three months ago uh, to a neighbor of mine. Uh, this is a picture of her house. Uh, a neighbor of mine had a hundred foot tall pine tree that w the soil uh, was weakened, the root system was weakened as a result of the rain that we've had. You know, we've had a ridiculous amount of rain this winter. And so a hundred foot tall pine tree, pine tree fell on my neighbor, she's about four houses up from me, fall on her house and kill two people that were in the house. They were, it's a VRBO, she was renting it. And uh, here's a picture of the house without the tree on it. And it completely demolished it and just wreaked havoc and, you know, death ensued. Two people died. Uh, they are obviously in family systems of various kinds. So you think of the ripple effect of that uh, in, in their families. And I don't really know where they were from. I believe it was someplace like on the East Coast or something. They were here for work, a work conference. There was another person staying in the bottom floor, did not die, uh, was injured a bit. But And then the ripple effect of this all around uh, my neighborhood was profound. Uh, Donna is the woman who owns this home, and I do, Teresa and I, my wife and I do prayer walks. Uh, wherever we live, we, we do prayer walks w uh, there, and even when we don't live somewhere, <laughs> we do prayer walks, but, but so we've done prayer walks. I had met Donna, and it was just, it was really, she was obviously, uh, you know, beyond devastated by this event. You can only imagine, she was in, there's a home you don't see in front of this demolished home, so she was asleep. Uh, this happened in the wee hours of the morning, and all we heard was this giant, you know, crack and kind of crash sound, and then the fire engines and everything uh, came. But, but that's how gravity works, both physically, in this case it caused death and havoc and all that, but it works the same way in our lives. The darkness, the sin, and that's why I love the, the part that Marcus and the team did at the end, Keep us where the light is. Because that's what we all need, right? And the, the reality is, especially as it relates to this weekend, is that Jesus brings light into the darkest parts of our lives. There's no place that's so dark that he doesn't want to shine his light in it. That's just our problem in our minds. But that's not a problem for Jesus. He wants to bring the light in every place in our lives. This was true 2,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago, and today. It's just as relevant, just as real today as it was back then. So let's go in our Bibles. We're going to go to John chapter 8, verses 12 through 20. So you guys can pull out your phones. I thought it would be cool to just uh, have our phones or whatever. I have an iPad in my case. Uh, and just read this passage of Scripture together. Everybody take out your phones. Show them to me. Yeah. The light in the darkest of places, right? The light in the darkest of places. Let me set the table for us. We are on the Temple Mount 2,000 years ago in this scene. Jesus is there. It is the Feast of Tabernacles, one of the pilgrimage feasts of the people of Israel. That means that they would go on pilgrimage and travel to their holy city, the Jerusalem, to the temple. And there would be this festival that would last for seven days. And the festival had a lot of dimensions to it. It, it took place in late autumn. It was definitely a harvest festival of all the, you know, the crops and the vines and the wine. And there was all of that that was a part of it. But it, it ultimately does symbolize the way in which God 
uh, had the people of God travel through the Exodus period and, you know, tabernacled for 40 years in the wilderness and how God provided for them. And there are two ceremonies inside of that celebration. One's called the water testimony, and Jesus uses that one as well, and we'll see it in the series. But this one is the light ceremony. This is the lighting ceremony. This, in this section of Scripture, is likely the last day of the celebration because the, the uh, Festival of Lights would take place on the, in this event. And so I want you to picture the Temple Mountain, so it's higher than any other place in Jerusalem, on which the temple is, the Temple of Herod, Herod's temple, and outside of which, in the Court of Women, uh, there are these four 75-foot-tall, kind of like giant candelabras, 75 feet tall, with four golden giant bowls on each of them. So there's 16 bowls filled with oil, and then they're lit on fire to symbolize the, the way in which God led the Israelites by the pillar of fire and the way he still wants to lead us today. This becomes a huge metaphor in the Jewish culture. It's, it's there cover to cover in Scripture, the power of light, the power of fire, and in Jesus' case, the power of himself being there. Now, he's in the court of the women. That's not to be uh, mis, uh, what, uh, misrepresented, if I could put it. For him to be delivering these words in the court of the women, yes, men could go there. That was where the offerings were brought. It's just that it has specific significance because Jesus ultimately liberates all people. There is no bigotry in amongst the people of God, or there's supposed to not be. But how many of you know we need a little bit more light there, right? We need a little bit more of Christ's light to shine into our bigotry issues. It's also, though, a gender issue, our view of women. Jesus, of course, transforms this by having women followers, and, he's, and it ultimately pans out into Paul's writings where he says, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, male nor female in God's eyes, right? And so it's, it's not to be missed that Jesus is doing this in that court of the women. And so let's read it. Let's read it. Jesus speaking, and he says this. When Jesus had spoke again to the people, he said, and here is again the I am statement. I am the light of the world. And you, we've taught you on both. Amy taught it last week, and I taught it the weekend before. When Jesus says this particular kind of I am, ego emi in the Greek, uh, eye, in the Hebrew, he is calling himself the God who appeared to Moses on Mount Sinai, the burning bush. He's that God. He's the God who gave the Ten Commandments. He is the God who led them through the desert, the second person of the Trinity, for God the Father, God the Son, and God the who? Holy Spirit, that's right. So I am the light of the world. Not just, by the way, this goes global now. This breaks down the Jewish Gentile issue, the Jewish Samaritan issue, the Jewish Greek issue, the Jewish Roman issue. Remember, they're under Roman rule here in this time in history. And then he says, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. In other words, we'll always have the light available to us if we follow Jesus. But we'll have the light, and it's not just light. It's the light of what? What's it say? Life. Of life. It's the light of life. So the Pharisees challenge him. Now, the Pharisees go sideways, as was common to them. <laughs> Jesus says something, and they go, oy vey. <laughs> they, they just go sideways. They get involved in a legal argument because they're not used to a rabbi teaching in such a fashion where they would not have a witness because in the Old Testament law, it required teachers of authority to have witnesses, to have other people who would testify in the same case. So they say to Jesus, they get caught in this kind of legal challenge, if you will, because they're missing his point of who he actually is. Remember, some of the Pharisees believe in Jesus. Most of them do not. So the Pharisees challenged him, here you are, a appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. And Jesus answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid. For I know where I am, uh, came from and where I am going. But you have no idea where I come from or where I'm going. Now he's talking to the religious aristocracy. He's talking to the religious leaders, okay? You have no idea uh, where I come from or where I'm going. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, 
My decisions are true because I'm not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. Jesus, the incarnation of God. In your own law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. I am one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. Then they asked him, where's your father? And then Jesus says, this is really powerful. Uh, there are a couple of words in the Greek language for know, uh, to know someone. Uh, Gnosko would be the word for, I, I know you, meaning I know who you are, I know what your name is, you know, I, I kind of know about you. Oida is a far more relational knowing. Uh, it's really the kind of dominant motif of the gospel, that through Jesus, God is demonstrating in the incarnation that he is imminent, that he is near, that he is knowable, being to being, that, that we can have a radical relationship with God. So Jesus says to them, he uses that relational word, he says, you do not know me or my father. So how true is that of you? Me. This is a dynamic. It's a relational dynamic. You do not know me or my father, Jesus replied. If you knew me, you would know my father also. And then it says in verse 20, John, uh, John's just giving us context. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple courts near the, this is the court of the women, near the place where the offerings were put. Yet, notice, a theme in John's gospel is the sovereignty or the super influence of God in the world of freedom. Uh, so it's just, just fascinating. John will refer to it many, many times in the gospel. He just has this last little commentary, yet no one sees him. Why? Why? Because his hour had not yet come. His hour had not yet come. Now, when it comes to spirituality and spiritual truths, you guys have to be careful of something. It's, it's sort of hidden a bit in the text, but it's this. Everything seems all right until you lose track of the light. Like, everything seems all right in your life until you lose track of the light, and then everything goes sideways. How many of you have ever been in the dark and, like, stubbed a toe or banged your nose or bumped your head? right? Everything seems fine. I was in the army on a boat, <laughs> and I remember, you know, learning this lesson profoundly, hitting a bulkhead with my forehead, uh, though I did have hair, not much, but whatever. <laughs> Everything seems fine until you lose track of the light, and that's where you break a toe, that's where you break a nose, that's where it all happens, that's where, that's where it comes down. So what did Jesus mean when he says, I am the light of the world? Now certainly, as I taught you in the opening week and we reiterated last week, of course it means that he is Yahweh, eh, yeah, from uh, the book of Exodus, that he is the all-powerful one, the all-knowing one, the omnipresent one. He is all of that. But it, there's some other dimensions to it that I, I kind of want to point out today in a, in a sort of unique way. This first one, he fulfilled the hopes of the people who had long been suffering in darkness. And this could be relevant to you. You may be this, where you have long been suffering in darkness. I suppose it's sort of true of all of us because life is a mixture, isn't it? You know what I mean? Um, uh, one of my mentors, he says it this way, life runs on two tracks like a railroad track. One track is kind of awesome. The other track, kind of a train smash, right? How many of you have kids? You know what I'm talking about. You know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's like, everything seems fine, and then, right? <laughs> they go off the rails, and it totally impacts you, right? Isaiah the prophet, uh, and I'm going to try and share with you Old Testament prophecies, just like Danny did in the uh, Lenten moment from uh, chapter 53. This is from chapter 9, because Isaiah is prophesying hundreds of years forward to the people of God 2,000 years ago, but to us today, okay? So it's, it's both then and now, and it's future. There's always that uh, sort of mountain horizon of prophecy. There's the immediate uh, you know, visibility of it, then there's sort of layers coming towards you, and they only become more clear as you get closer to them. 
So Isaiah is talking about that. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light, and those living in the land, a deep darkness, a deep darkness, a light has dawned. He's certainly talking about the incarnation. He's talking about this event. Prophetically, he's looking forward to the Feast of Tabernacles on the Temple Mount, where Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Now, you have to understand from a biblical historical perspective, there are what's called the 400 years of silence. You might write this down in your notes. 400 years of silence, you can Google it uh, later, but it's th it refers to the 400 years between essentially the book of Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, and Jesus, the Jesus event. Uh, you could look at it a lot of different ways, not the least of which would be Simeon the prophet who appears on the scene when Jesus is dedicated in the temple when he's a baby, right? So, so there's, there's this reality for, for them, the, these 400 years of silence. And it's all been about their hopes and dreams and how they have had the two railroad tracks, if you will, you know, two, two uh, sides of the rail. So I want you to write this question down, and you can talk about it at lunch today or later on tonight or maybe in your life group this week. What are my hopes? What are my hopes? What are my dreams? They had theirs 2,000 years ago. You have yours today. What are your dreams that are unfulfilled yet? Like, what, what, is, their, what is the angst with regard to your goals that are out forward? And, it, and a lot of times people shame themselves. It's like you don't allow yourself the wonder to have a, a dream, to have, to have hopes. And a lot of times it's fear that keeps us back because we've had hopes and we've had them for a long time. A long time. Now, in context... 400 years of silence, okay? Raise your hand if you're younger than 400 years. <laughs> and this is part of the reality of, uh, remember, I'm always gonna teach you a, a biblical worldview. You and I tend to, because we're Western, not as much in the East, in the West, you and I tend to have a, a single generational view of spirituality. We tend to think of spiritual out, spirituality in terms of us and our lifetimes. We're taught this way, we're wired this way. Like in our lives, we're taught this way. Biblically speaking, that is not an accurate biblical worldview. A biblical worldview is multi-generational. This is why the Bible challenges you to leave wealth to your children. Not just monetary, but spiritual wealth. From a biblical perspective, it's seen as ungodly not to think like this. Read the book of Proverbs. So spiritually, hopes and dreams, like you need to, and how many of you are grandparents in the room? My grandkids arrive Wednesday. Grandparents, raise your hands up high, be proud. Be proud. All 12 of us. <laughs> but you know, like you're, if you guys are grandparents, you think about this, you, you know, you, this is something you lean into. Uh, anyway, what are your hopes? What are your dreams? Jesus comes to shed light on your hopes and dreams. And he uses words and position to open our hearts and, and our minds, not just our minds, our hearts and our minds. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple courts near the place where the offerings were put. He's very purposeful in how he does things, especially in these kinds of moments. I, I would argue all the moments of Jesus, uh, especially where the gospels kind of arrange it and, and you know, kind of, especially John, because he rearranges so much. So, so the, the Temple Mount in their world and in their culture was a holy place. Now, there wasn't something inherently holy about it, except for in the Old Testament period, that's where the very presence of God dwelt, right? But, but generally, like, kind of moving out from there, it, like things be, uh, become holy because the, the core idea of holy means this separated apart for a purpose. It tends to have moral connotation and ethical con connotation, but not, uh, not directly, it, it does by context. Like this coffee cup that I use for a water mug is holy because it's mine and nobody's allowed to put their lips on it and it's dedicated to me. Like I, I, get, I like water in it and I like to have it right here. So in that sense, it's holy. Then let's move out from there. Uh, the place you're in right now, physically. A little bit different for you guys online watching this, but okay, so this is just concrete, and I don't know what this is made out of. Wood, probably. Uh, it's not holy 
but it becomes holy because it's separated apart for a purpose. So you come in here and you meet God. Look at the cross over there. That cross, there's nothing inherently holy about it except for it becomes holy because many of you have prayed at the foot of that cross. You have, you've experienced God there. When we do the rally before service, all the leaders meet, you know, that are serving everywhere, and uh, we pray over every chair, by the way. Every chair, like every chair, you're like all those chairs, we pray literally over every single chair before you get here. So that chair, we pray that that space becomes a holy space for you. So let me push it one step further. In my home, I have several holy places. They're the places I personally meet with Jesus every morning. Every morning of my life, I meet with Jesus in essentially two chairs in this time of year. Uh, and I, I, I meet Jesus in those chairs. Thus, those chairs become holy. My question to you is, where is your holy chair? If you don't have one, you're not allowing the, the position if you will, and the words of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, to really get at your heart and mind. This is why I want you to do the Lenten devotional. How many of you are doing the Lenten devotional that Teresa wrote, my wife wrote? Raise your hands up. Those of you who aren't, aren't where do they find this devotional? Online, I know, but where specifically? Newbreak.church slash Lent. Newbreak.church slash Lent. There's all kinds of people that are doing this devotional. Teresa, my wife, wrote it. It's, re if I dare say, it's really, really good. Uh, some life groups are using it as their curriculum. Uh, she had editors edit it and, and so forth. It's really, really, I want her to publish it. It's, it's amazing. Where is your holy chair? Where is your holy chair? Jesus wants to bring light into your day every single day, not just special days, not just on Sunday in our case, every day. And he offers a simple invitation for us to follow him. Notice what he says. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. Well, what does he mean? We all struggle with darkness as followers of Christ, but we don't need to. We struggle with it because that's part of our condition post, you know, salvation, pre-heaven. See, heaven is ahead of you. This, ladies and gentlemen, is earth. <laughs> and so this is a battle zone. But whoever follows me Whoever follows me won't walk in darkness, doesn't need to walk in darkness. That's what all of this Jesus means when he says, I am the light of the world. And whenever I close my eyes to Jesus, leading me in the here and now, I choose to remain in the darkness. That's where I'm going to break a toe, break a nose, poke my eye out. This is where it's all going to come down to. Now, I want you to think about the ways in which he leads, the ways in which he leads us. Okay, so think about it. I want you to come up with one in your mind. A way he leads you. What, what's one way from this section? One way he leads you. Music, okay, music, especially worship music, right? Okay, what's one thing from this section? Prayer. Okay, good. You guys. Got nothing, huh? <laughs> come on. That was this section. They're helping you. They're feeling, they're feeling your pain. My children, what's a way that God leads you over there? He talks to us. Hi, Alan. I didn't even see you until I heard your voice. It's good to see you. Praying for you always. Anyway, uh, yeah, he talks to us, right? He talks to us like in our minds. He talks to us through circumstances, closed doors, open doors. He talks to us through... The Word, the Scriptures, okay? That's why I want you to be people of the book. People like in Acts where they called them the, you know, the, they were Bereans because they studied the words to see if the apostles were teaching them the truth according to the Old Testament. All of these things are true. And this is, why he, this is what he wants to do in our lives. And uh, John said, or Jesus says earlier in John, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. We live in an incredibly evil world. I mean, there are just so many examples. This week, in New Zealand, people walked into a mosque and murdered. To last, to last night, I know the count was 50 people died last week. What was the city called? 
Christ church, how ironic, how, uh, how horrible that is. Terrible, incredible evil in our world. Do you know how many abortions took place in 2018? Write it down, 41 million. Some of you math people can do the math on how many a minute. This is the world in which we live, an incredibly dark world. We're in a world that's tore up from the floor up. Why? All because of a lack of uh, absolute truth, all because of a belief in subjective relativism. We live in a culture that is truly believing they are autonomous. And when we live in that kind of a culture as theonomous, God's law, God's ways, when we live in an autonomous culture, we lose our minds. But this is a struggle for all of us, yes? A struggle for every single one of us. So what are the things in your life that cause you to stumble in the darkness? What are the things that happen in normal people's lives? Normal people's lives, and I put these on your outline, I put a bullet list. It's just different uh, ways in which we stumble and trip in the dark. Suffering. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've seen people run away from God because they lost someone in their life. This is Teresa's mom's story. When her mother died, Teresa's mother made a vow, and the vow was, I will never go to a church again, and none of my children will ever go to a church again because God killed my mom. That happens across America, and you must develop a biblical response to that. It's called theodicy, theodicy, T-H-E-O-D-I-C-Y. Google it. You need to study to show yourself approved, a workman of Scripture. You need to study the issue of theodicy. Where is God when it hurts? Where is God, the God who disappoints? These guys are 400 years in silence, and that yet there they are on the Temple Mount. All of these things, shame. Write down Romans 10, 11. Romans 10, 11, uh, where it says shame. I love that verse. I'm, I just memorized it. It's uh, the, the one, basically, the one who believes in Jesus will never be put to shame. That's a great verse. That's a great verse. The one who believes in Jesus will never be put to shame. And Jesus came to illumine our path. His fundamental thing here in the temple of uh, the Feast of Tabernacles is to be the ceremony. He is the ceremony of light. The ceremony of light in the Festival of the Tabernacles always foreshadowed Jesus, both his incarnation and his cross and Easter, but then his second coming, the rapture of the church, the second coming of the kingdom of heaven. All of this is true, and it's all relative to you. It's all for you. It's all for me. It's all for us. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, that is something to just praise God for. I mean, imagine still walking in darkness. And if you're here, you haven't begun your relationship with Jesus yet. You can begin your relationship with Jesus. You can begin to have the light come into your life and change your life from the inside out. Now, having said that, it is not just for you and I. It's for everyone in our lives, all of us. This is, this is what it's about, you guys, like wherever you live. Like Teresa and I are the light of our neighborhood. We're the light of our neighborhood. You are the light of your neighborhood. I don't know where you live. How many of you live in Tierra Santa? Okay, some of you. So, you, like you kind of gang tackle ta Tierra Santa. So you, like when we do outreaches, you're the light, you're bringing the light. But wherever you live, you are the light. Like on my street, I am the light. Teresa is the light. Now, my neighbor across the street goes to the OB campus. Now, and their name's Patrick and Tricia, so they're the light. They're the light. Donna, the lady up at the top of my street. So we know her. We've, we've talked with her many times. She loves my bike, as a matter of fact. My bike is light. It's luminescent. Anyway, um, so she loved my bike, whatever. So we know her, and we do prayer walks around her house. We pray for her without her even knowing it. But Teresa went up there that morning that the tree fell and crushed the house. Uh, you know, like police were walking through our house. They didn't want to walk all the way down the street, so they were walking through our house to get to the front of the house and then walk up to Donna's. And so it was like this huge thing. Anyway, Donna, Teresa asked Donna, hey, can we come up later and pray for you? And Donna said, yes. Yeah. So later on that day, Teresa and I went up, and, and uh, Patrick and Trish, Trisha particularly, she wanted to go up and pray with us for that. You see how light is? It's like that, right? It's like what happens in a neighborhood. And so, so then we went up. Trisha wasn't available, but we went up, and, and uh, then there was Donna with like three of her friends on her porch, tears coming down their faces. This was major trauma you can only imagine. 
And so we got to pray with her. It's like a God moment on the porch that became now viral. Because see, there's darkness all over my neighborhood because two people were killed in a tragic accident. In that home, this week, they began to demolish it. So it's been like this giant, I don't know what to call it other than PTSD producing visual on my street. Like every day, people stop and take pictures. Uh, movie, uh, TV guys were there this week. So, so we got to pray with them. That's what you do, though. That's what you are. You're built for this. You're built to do this. First John, Jesus says, this is the message we'd heard from him and declare to you, God is what? Light, and in him there is no darkness at all. But if we claim to walk in the light and have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. That's why you can always, you know, uh, you can always see the fruit of whether or not somebody is a Christ follower or not. This difference between a Christian and a Christ follower. So if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship with one another. I say it all the time. You can't give away what you don't have. You cannot give away what you do not have. And you do give away what you have. You are an influence wherever you are. So how can we be a light? How can we do this? Now I'm going to show you a screen. Well, I'll, I'll click to it because I want you to take a picture of it. Okay, this isn't anywhere. This is a compilation of resources that I collected. These are books I've read. They're incredible. I'll talk about them in a minute. So you can take your phones out, take a picture of this. Uh, particularly, well, I'll do this in a second, but you can do that. I want to talk to you for a second about your God story. Now, these are tremendous tools that will equip you to share your faith with an atheist, a scientist, a, um, a different person, a person of a different uh, philosophical basic worldview, like an autonomous person, that kind of thing. This will help you with all of that. But, but I, want you to talk, I want to talk to you for a minute about your God story. Uh, how many of you are in the military? Raise your hands. You're in the military. First of all, we honor you. We thank you for serving. You are amazing, okay? Amazing. But, but let me just say, you who are in the military, God has wired you by your family of origins issues, spiritually, so forth. Your gift matrix comes into who you are as a military person. So at the core, you have to understand you are wired by God to reach your best. The people you reach the easiest, generally speaking, are military people. You're wired for it. You live it every day. Uh, how many of you are stay-at-home moms? Stay-at-home moms or dads? Raise your hands up. Stay-at-home moms or dads? You're uniquely wired to reach, uh, you know, stay-at-home moms and dads. It's like your deal. It's your jam. God's wired you for it. Um, you know, if you're a working mom, he's wired you for that. You, you are, if you're a scientist, you're wired by God to reach scientists. If you're a teacher, you're wired by God to reach teachers. It's who he's made you to be. Okay, so your God story is your strongest friend. That's what I tend to use the most. They want to hear my current pain. They want to hear the relevance my prayer life has with my pain. Even if they're an atheist, they actually want to hear it. Having said that, these books, these resources will help you. Uh, language of God, Francis Collins, he is the head, was the head of the Human Genome Project. He is one of the most brilliant people in the world, a person totally committed to Jesus and Scripture. He wrote the language of God as a result of his, his uh, work. Uh, his view might be a little bit different from yours, but I'm telling you what, I have given atheists that book, and that book cracks them. They, they, can't, they don't know quite what to do with that book. Signature of the Cell is written on the heels of his work. Uh, Stephen Meyer, that's a work that is taking the power of DNA and, and the cell and arguing for the existence of God from that vantage point. On they go. If I could just commend one thing to you, uh, most of you tend to not read as much as listen to. So Rabbi Zacharias, the one on the bottom, if you want to hear him talk, he is an amazing scholar. He works in a school of scholars, all apologists for the faith. If you want to hear his views on evolution, on, on uh, time, on philosophy at any level, he and Os Guinness, they're just amazing. Uh, this particular one is incredible. And it's about your mission, you guys. It's not, the light's not just for you. It's for everybody around you. Jesus talks about it in the Sermon on the Mount. It's for everybody around you. 
It's not just for us. You maybe were in church as a kid and you learned a song. This little light of mine. How many of you know that song? I'm going to let it shine. It comes from this passage. You are the light of the world now. Now you're a reflection, okay? But, but okay, so people are in your life. This is Easter for crying out loud. You need to bring people to church on Easter. Everybody will come to church on Easter. I mean, seriously, if you can't bring somebody to church on Easter, you're challenged. I need to talk to you after church. <laughs> Who is it? Because you're supposed to be reflecting the light of Jesus. How many of you like the moon rise? You like moons? Moons? If, you ever, if you're not in Tierra Santa, it, when, in October, when you drive up Tierra Santa Boulevard and the full moon is out, it'll blind you. Now, does the moon have light in and of itself? No. What's it reflecting? The sun, the light of the sun, right? So what makes the moon go dark? Yeah, when the world gets in the way. So is the world getting in the way of you reflecting the light of Jesus to your world? Let's bow our heads and pray about that.